Hi, everyone. Welcome to Conveyor Meetup. So today we have John Brisbane from Open Rewrite who will be presenting to us. Super excited about this one. Um, so this is an open source project that I believe the Tackle team is looking at and, and Tackle is part of the Khmeri community. So we're super excited to see what's under the covers for this open source project and see how others are using it. Um, just some, a few housekeeping items. Well, really just one. I will send out the slides in the recording about one to two days after this meetup ends. And I'll send the, the slides in the recording to the conveyor email list and I'll also put it in the LinkedIn event page. So that way you can have access to it. Um, and I think that's it. That's all we have. That's all I have for housekeeping. John, it's, it's all yours. All right. Thanks. Uh, excited to be with you today. I'm going to start sharing my screen. If uh, you need it a little bigger, whatever, hard to see, just, uh, just I guess, drop a comments there. Yeah, so here's what we're going to be discussing today. So we're going to start with introducing you a little bit to Open Rewrite. What is Rewrite? Um, you know, what is what is kind of the uh what, what is the history of it what you know why why does it exist how is it unique uh, that sort of thing just to give you some some basic context uh and then we're going to go into basically two specific areas so we're going to look at uh, uh making uh, structural changes to yaml documents uh assuming that many people uh that deploy on kubernetes and use microservices have a number of resources that they need to control and there's various ways to do that and you know one of them is just by uh the easiest, obviously, is to is to manipulate YAML directly. Um, I'm going to demonstrate an operator that is like kind of the next level up that takes your YAML and um, and makes it uh, infrastructure as code is sort of. Um, I'm going to be using the Java operator SDK, which is uh, a really cool uh, framework that is sort of um, inspired by the GoLang operator SDK, but it uh, puts it into the world of Java. We're going to be mixing uh, some Spring Boot in, and all of this is like to kind of give you give you the story of um, of how you can use rewrite to make con consistent structural changes that are basically impossible to make any other way uh, that that cross the boundaries of you know YAML and Java and uh, go into the functional areas. We're going to look at you know maybe some cost control stuff. Um, and, and this area that I'm, I'm kind of talking, talking about, uh, I've mentioned it on LinkedIn before and whatnot, uh, of innovation enablement. And, uh, I'll go into a little bit of what I mean by that because I kind of invented that term. So, um, uh, yeah, so let's get started. So first, what is open rewrite? So essentially, um, uh, open rewrite is a tool to make uh, type aware transformations and to trace th those uh, changes throughout your code base. Um, the open source side of it, open rewrite, what we're talking about today is the, um, the projects around uh, the open rewrite uh, GitHub, which you can, you can see here on, we have a, a, an open rewrite organization and then the main rewrite uh, repository has uh, a lot of different uh, uh, stuff in it here for different Making changes to Java, Maven, XML, YAML, etc. There's a link to our uh, our documentation right here at the top, which we're we're going to be going through a little bit. Um, but it, it it's important to understand that um, these these are not just these changes that we're going to be making are not textual only changes, which is sort of how like all of your changes that you would make today uh, would need to be done. So. Uh, you create a Helm chart, you create, uh, you know, you're just uh, using YAML, you're using, you know, Gauntlet or, or you know, Jinja or any any other tool that you would pick. And those are all textual templating uh, um, mechanisms that really divorce the structure of your YAML and the knowledge about uh, uh, kind of the model that's Im embedded in your YAML, especially as it relates to Kubernetes resources, because all of that YAML is significant. It has, um, uh, you know, the, it has meaning and all the different uh, the resources, you know, have different specs and things like that. So the structure of your document is important. And of course, if you've ever tried to use like say a Helm chart and you forget to put the little dash on your template, you know, to 
get your line endings off and your style is, you know, white space is, is screwed up and, uh, you know, you uh, have to get your indentation correct and all that stuff that, that goes with YAML. Those are all things that you have to be concerned with if you're using traditional templating. And um, what, uh, what rewrite does for you is it abstracts away the structure of the document and the code and whatever else that you're dealing with into uh, an abstract syntax, abstract syntax tree, say that five times fast. Um, why is that important? So kind of the canonical example that was, uh, uh, that we use for, uh, for rewrite where it, where it came from, uh, how it grew up, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to give you the whole life story, but, uh, you know, at least the adolescence anyway. Um, so when you, when you go about like implementing your own library, which was the case here, it was a logger library that was implemented and it was a, a custom library. Um, of course you make API decisions and, and you decide that you're going to, uh, pass a string, you're going to use the percent as string format, you're going to pass an, uh, an exception as your second, uh, uh, parameter and then the replacement string, like, you know, these are all decisions that you make in your, in your library. And then once you start uh, propagating your library and socializing your library to the rest of your code base, then you're, you're really kind of wedded to this. And, and uh, it's not as simple as just like changing the API to something else because you've got uses of this uh, elsewhere. And this is, this was the case, you know, years and years after deprecating a custom library and still couldn't get off of it to move, you know, because of the a number of changes that needed to be made that were specific to uh, the use of this library. And so the fact that, you know, you've got an exception type as the second parameter and then, you know, replacement parameters as the third, et cetera. Those things are not, and, and, and changing the, you know, changing the uh, uh, percent S to, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the placeholder uh, the bracket, uh, curly bracket placeholder of SLF4J. Those are, those are not changes that are easy to make throughout your code base in a way that's safe and consistent and predictable. Um, uh, you would have to use some kind of like, uh, you know, uh, textual templating thing. So the way that rewrite addresses this, and we're using Java code as the example, but I'll show you, uh, uh YAML here in a little bit. Um, is that, is that, uh, what, on, on any of the languages or structures that, uh, that rewrite supports, we actually create this abstract syntax tree, this AST of including type information for all of the code and the resources that we understand. So here you can see we're, we're actually like reading the Java code. We're, you know, under the covers using, uh, you know, Java compiler and we're creating tokens and things like that. And so then we're creating this AST that we can then manipulate. Now, a compiler would take this AST, you know, not the open rewrite specific one, but the one that's generated by the compiler, and it would generate, you know, by code, or it would generate native code if it was a different kind of compiler. Um, but the interesting thing about representing your code and your resources as an AST rather than as text uh, is that you maintain the structure of your document so that you can make structural uh, changes, mutations that are safe because you know the structure of the document. When you make textual changes, you don't know that. Not for sure. And you can't really tell where you are in the context of the document. You only know what your expectations are. And if ever there's a deviation from your expectation, then it's going to, that it's going to break. Not, not the case with, uh, a, a structural tree of information about, uh, uh, about what is happening. So, um, uh, in, in YAML, we'll see kind of what that, what that looks like here. Um, first, I do want to kind of, uh, take a little bit of a diversion here. I've got a, I've got a project going that, like I said, um, uh, tries to bring together a number of these things that we do in, uh, uh Kubernetes and in microservice applications that, um, you know, are sometimes hard to represent uh, uh, consistently in a, you know, in a single thing. And so, uh, I'm using, uh, an operator, uh, which if you're not familiar with operators, like it's, it's just a special class of application that uses a client to the Kubernetes server that creates resources and manages resources for you rather than just doing kubectl apply or delete or any of those things. Uh, it, it essentially is doing that, at, uh, internally and it's using 
using code to do that. And, and I'm doing a, a hybrid uh, uh, operator here, which is partly the YAML code, which you would, uh, you, you would recognize if you were doing just plain static uh, YAML and deploying this deployment and you would do kubectl apply. But I'm having the, uh, um, I'm having the uh, resource controller actually do this uh, for the operator. And um, the reason is because I'm, I'm again, going to be making like structural changes. I'm going to be making them at a couple different levels. And uh, one of the things that I mentioned with templating, you know, is the, um, what, what do you do about being able to, you know, replace values of things? So in, uh, in a traditional uh, deployment, uh, scenario, I would be, uh, uh, I would be creating a, uh, creating a template uh, of a resource and then, um, I would have to put placeholders in, in place of the actual values that, that I wanted to represent. Uh, I, that, that's limiting, uh, uh, you know, for, for simple, like replacing this text string is not that bad. But what if you wanted to add this entire uh, label? What if you wanted to add a different label? What if you wanted to change the name of the label because you started with app, but now you wanted to use full application or you wanted to do, you know, put the domain on there? I mean, there's all of these changes that could go along with, uh, you know, changing this YAML that are not simply, you know, easily easy to express in terms of a template. So why try and encapsulate all the possible potential variations of this thing with a template just give uh just give your uh just give your yaml and then we'll change it later and so we'll do that in in two different ways and one of the reasons i wanted to use an operator is also to kind of give you an idea of like what what the possibilities are of of doing these kind of layered abstracted changes because now i can make changes directly to my yaml static yaml and i can change this uh, this app label, which is going to end up being a match label, which is going to, you know, I'm going to repeat this as the name of my metadata, and it's also going to appear in the, you know, in this, the pod spe uh, template. So all of these, all of these things are um, uh, changes that kind of need to be made, made together and consistently. Otherwise, it's going to break because you can't change your app labels, you know, without changing the match labels, and you know that includes the the um, the, the label name, etc., and so this this is this is kind of how we're going to uh, approach this uh, approach this problem. So first, I'm going to show how I'm going to change uh, uh, YAML itself uh, so that I can propagate changes uh, across a code base. Um, so you see here, I've got uh, I've, I've got the, the this name of my application, which is essentially like a placeholder. So if I was doing a template of this, I might Put a you know variable placeholder thing, but I don't need to do that now because I can just put uh, I can just put a value in there. Now I'm going to be using two different components of rewrite. So uh, with with rewrite we have a, a Maven plugin and a Gradle plugin, so you can incorporate execution of uh, recipes, uh, which which are uh, either in YAML format or uh, as code, uh, and and I'm hopefully going to be showing both of those. Uh, uh, if I don't follow garden paths and get distracted, so we'll try and uh, we'll try and do that. Um, but the, the the first way I want to show you is 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 how we incorporate these in this uh, uh, into our projects uh, using the the Maven uh, plugin, which uh, I'm using in this case because I'm using Spring Boot. I'm using the Java Operator SDK. Uh, I'm using uh, some other capability, some other plugins that can generate, you know, the application deployed into Kubernetes. All these things are kind of coming together all in this in this one thing. And there isn't uh, there there isn't uh, in anything uh, in being able to rewrite recipes and apply changes consistently that is like somehow inconsistent with all of these other tasks that you end up doing. It's it's really perfectly perfectly integrated. So. Uh, this, this, the name of this recipe is actually, um, uh, there's a couple different ways you can specify recipes, and one of them is by creating a YAML file in this meta and free write uh, resources directory. And, uh, and, and I, can, uh, I can give it a name, I can you know, give it um, so, some display names and things like that. These, these will show up in, uh, I'll, I'll show you, uh, I'll log into our SAS and show you 
um, how, uh, how that kind of is represented when you uh, incorporate those into there. Uh, but essentially what we're gonna end up doing is just running a, running a recipe that in this case is a change value. And we're gonna target just the, the name uh, for right now. We're gonna say, just change it to, the, to this value and we're gonna target specific um, uh, files, which we have a convention in this project where uh, you know, I'm using Nginx and, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to target this convention. This is optional. I don't, I don't need to specify this or I can, you know, uh, I can, I can uh, uh, structure this, uh, you know, in a different way. And so there is a, a, the, there's a rewrite plugin then uh, that's part of Maven. It gives a couple, uh, uh, gives a couple tasks. Uh, that we can run, uh, we can we can discover recipes that are there. Um, we can to see, and it, it picks up uh, you know any um, uh, picks up any uh, recipes that are part of the core of Open Rewrite, which uh, we distribute. Uh, that and and there's a v various other um, extensions to Open Rewrite. Uh, right now, I'm including the Kubernetes. Uh, uh, rules and so those show up. There's some different styles that we can we can look at. So um, how do I have this? Sorry, this uh, we got a little thing at the bottom here, right where I want to type. Uh, dry run. So we have a, an option to actually uh, perform changes and um uh don't commit them back to the code base but just write them into a patch file so that we can see kind of like what changes are going to be made and so we're running this base recipe change value uh it has discovered based on our file pattern that there's a couple yaml files that it can operate on uh and then if we open this in our code code we can see that uh, that it's making you know it's making these structural changes. Um, we don't have to worry about you know white space because that's handled because it's a recipe because uh, we know about white space in the AST. We know exactly the structure of the document, uh, and we can <clears throat> we can preserve that. Uh, uh, we can preserve all of those uh, those changes uh, carefully. So. And then of course you see this is a list, so I can actually stack up these changes if I wanted to. And uh, yeah. uh, I can say, okay, now I wanna change the labels. I wanna change the app label and match that. And we'll just, we'll leave that as the same. And then let's run this again. All right, let's check out our patch file. And so now we're we're starting to make more significant changes where we're actually changing <clears throat> we're actually changing our labels in, in a different section of the document. We're changing the name and keeping it consistent. Uh, and and then we could of course keep keep adding uh, uh, changes to this as uh, as many changes as we need. We could add match labels and and uh, uh, all kinds of other changes. Uh, uh, directly in our project, only on the files that are within the context of our project, uh, and um, it, it only it only happens at uh, at build time. That's kind of one of the limitations of the uh, of using the plugin. So it gives you the access to that, but uh, I'll show you in the stats uh, how that's a little bit uh, a little bit different. So uh, let me look at notes real quick. Make sure. I've covering everything okay so i did mention that we're making structural changes uh so we've made structural changes to our um uh made structural change we haven't saved them yet but if we just do a regular re uh, run then that it will update these on the file system and, and do, choose what we want to do with these so we can actually change this externally now you may not want to do that just as in a, in a uh, uh, you know, you may not want to necessarily use a, a recipe to change something that's just locally in your project, but that's not really the power of what uh, a rewrite helps you think about because that is not the only reference to your name of your deployment or the label 
app, my application with, within your microservice architecture. I mean, this, you know, over any period of time, these things propagate throughout. And since there isn't an easy, consistent, you know, holistic way to uh, templatize and to make changes, these things just propagate like everywhere. And that's why uh, having a rewrite recipes that you can run uh, uh, becomes really important across across your whole organization, all of your code base, all of your repositories. Um, so we could we could actually uh, do the same thing if we went uh, uh, in, it, uh, and and we can uh, we'll, we're opening this beta up so that you can you can play around with this and you can see uh, what I'm showing here. Uh, I'm just showing you this because so it expedites our conversation a little bit. Uh, and it's it's a good way to uh, um, to kind of see this uh, visually. So uh, if we if we go into our YAML uh, uh, recipes, which are going to operate on any YAML file, regardless of you know Kubernetes or not, um, we can do things like find find properties. We can find uh, these entries by uh, XPath expression. And so let's let's say if I'm I know that I have a server uh, port, which is um, which is a application YAML value. And I need to find out all of the references to that because um, that's kind of like a, that's gonna have to be changed hard coded, right? That's like server port and then it's a hard code reference. And so in order to make changes to that and to migrate to different port numbers and things like that, I actually have to go through uh, and, and run that everywhere. But I need to see, uh, you know, where, I'm currently where I'm currently using the, those values. And so we have uh, over 300 repositories of open source projects that have already been uh, ingested into the SAS. And so why that's important is you, you kind of think, you know, when you when you start making changes, you know, you're like sort of in the mind of, of only making changes within, you know, my project. But uh, one of the interesting things about uh, uh, rewrite and being able to have access to everyone else's code bases uh, is that you can actually test out changes that you're making um, across the across the uses of it in the industry and you can see there's actually quite a quite a few times where this uh, server port is is uh, 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 is being referenced uh, spring cloud stuff obviously and we're going to see uh, spring cloud server yeah we're, we're setting uh, the port number in there and so this helps us uh, really like focus the changes that we need to make, uh, which is going to help us in, in a couple different areas. So I mentioned before, um, like, so, so this kind of shows you how, how uh, rewrite is gonna help you with YAML. Um, but, but to what end, right? So we can make changes of things. Um, we can, you know, go in and change the name of the labels and things like that. But that's that's really kind of, um, uh, that's really kind of, of limited, like the, the value return, but the the, the real value that, you, that you're going to get from rewrite and being able to apply recipes across the code base is then actually making significant changes that affect your your application. So let's say that you want to um, uh, uh, we want to make sure that our resources uh, have uh, we don't exceed a particular uh, a limit. Let's say uh, we can we can find an exact limit so that we can uh, we can go through and through our repositories and see where we're uh, uh, setting CPU limits uh, and and uh, you know to cap them to a specific thing. Or we can we can uh, even do things that are a little more complex. So this this particular recipe, this find exceeds resource ratio. This uh, this actually looks at specifically CPU or memory limits and requests and looks at the ratio between them and, and looks for any deviations beyond a given uh, maximum ratio. So if I say I want to look for any places where the CPU limits are more than twice the request uh, throughout, my, throughout my code base, then I, uh, I, can, I can run this recipe. And um, that that will give us like uh, okay here's a you know it looks like Istio right 
So Istio operator, okay, we have Istio. So let's look for limits. Ah, yep, sure enough. So um, we requested, you know, uh, 50 milli of uh, CPU, but uh, max it out at 200. So that's four times instead of uh, two times. And so one thing you'll notice uh, on uh, on this particular recipe, it actually understands units. So if this was MI or GI or any of the other units that Kubernetes resource limits understand, it has parsed that into an absolute value and it is making these comparisons based on that. So that is uh, that is that is kind of part of the recipe, and that's something that you can do in a recipe that accounts for like the the model of the data this represents. And so this, we know that this text value, this 200M or this 50M, actually has more meaning than quote 50M. And if we were to try and make this change textually, it would be really difficult because we'd have to come up with, uh, you know, we'd have to come up with our own uh, parsing of, you know, units and and conversion. And so all of this we've, we've baked into this recipe and there, uh, uh, there's a, a resource value abstraction that we can pull any text value in and we can we can parse it into resource value and then we can compare them against each other we can convert them into different ones and so all of this capability gets rolled up into uh into a recipe that you can run across your organization and across all of the uh, uh, uh across all of the uh repositories and here you know these are these are public repositories uh, uh, because these are, you know, the public ones, but, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna find the same thing. So, uh, Elasticsearch, staple set, look for limits. So it's like a 10 times difference here. So we say, well, that's, that's a, you know, an organization concern. Do we wanna, do we wanna make requests that are 10 times smaller than the limits? Or, or do we want to make sure that, um, because th th this is a, this is a cost control feature as well. Um, do you want to run into scheduling issues if your limit is so much higher than your request that, yeah, you can schedule on a node that has 100 megs free, but maybe it needs up to 1,000, uh, but it only has 500 available. Well, you can still schedule it because uh, you're only requesting 100, but you actually kind of need more than that. So uh, it's really would be better if, if this request and the limit was much closer to like a value that is realistic for your application. Um, so maybe you would set this to 500. Then of course you can write a recipe uh, that sets the container resource limits or container resource requests if you want to bring the requests up, you know, or you can bring uh, the, the the limits down. And, and it just would depend on uh, you know depend on the situation uh, on the situation that you're in uh, individually. <laughs> Uh, checking time check here. Okay, we're doing pretty good. I want to leave some time for uh, for questions as well. Um, so we've gone through unit conversion. We can we can uh, make structural changes to our YAML. Uh, we can um, uh, we can migrate uh, we can migrate uh, sections of YAML if we want to. Um, let's say make sure that. Uh, um, uh, you know, we've got, uh, the uh, RBAC settings correct. We've got several more recipes in here for finding, um, finding things specific to Kubernetes, like, uh, it knows about image tags. So we can find out, like, if we're using, uh, if we're using, let's say the latest of any, like, we're not specifying a version, we're not specifying a, uh, a particular tag. We're just, uh, you know, sucking in whatever, uh, whatever is the latest. Uh, which in some situations, like in development, of course, that's probably what we want. But then in production, obviously, we don't want that. So um, we need to be able to um, uh, find these uh, uses of this latest tag. And you can see this is actually an example where a recipe has um, not just like found colon latest as a text string. It's actually interrogated the model of this YAML, looked in the image, separated the image name into its component parts of repository and 
you know, and, and uh, image name and tag and SHA and all of these other things that like are make up uh, make up the uh, uh, the image tag, and then it it, it found that uh, we're using the latest tag, and then there's a, a there's an update image uh, uh, that we can use as well, so that if you know we find instances of this, we can we can target uh, and say, well, uh, I don't want to use latest, I want to use um, uh, you know v1.5 or whatever, so that we have a, a more stable, uh, predictable uh, environment, uh, and we're not just uh, randomly picking up changes. Uh, every time the pod gets rescheduled because we're using a preemptible node and it, it gets rescheduled and then it pulls in a new version of the application and you know things break. So uh, these are these are fundamental changes that we make throughout our code base that are have real impact on the application, the performance, and uh, and the cost of uh, of our application. So. I mentioned um, how we can uh, how we can help with Java too, and I want to show I don't I don't you know a lot a lot of people use a lot of different things for deploying on Kubernetes, but I'm going to show you uh, what are what, what kind of the Java capabilities specific to Kubernetes. Now there's lots of um, there's lots of recipes that will help us in just normal Java code and normal uh, maintenance. Uh, you know we've got uh, if you're using the Micronaut framework, we've got some migration recipes to go to newer versions. We've got, you know, formatting. We've got we can search for you know fields and methods that we're using uh, to determine if, for example, we're using a uh, uh, anywhere in our code base in any of our repositories, we're using specific versions of a method that we wrote in a library, right? So we can look for that target that specific method with those arguments. And we can find that in our in our code base. And then uh, we've got same as Micronaut. We've got for Corcus for upgrading. Uh, you know, if our if our we're writing a Corcus application and uh, we're upgrading through uh, the various uh, uh, versions of the library and new capabilities are being added and we want to take advantage of them, uh, then we've got recipes that uh, make bulk changes throughout your code base so that you can actually uh, uh, make use of that. Spring Boot, of course, we have quite a bit of support for. There's quite a few Spring recipes around. Uh, this this one is actually, you know, quite a quite a number of things that uh, are like uh, best practices and and uh, uh, closing vulnerabilities and things like that that are there. Uh, again, automated changes that make throughout your throughout your code base. Um, I, I did want to I did want to kind of briefly. Yeah, it's going to have to be briefly. Show you. Um, a what, what kind of what a recipe what a recipe looks like and and what what are what are some of the uh, uh, things that it can actually you know do uh, beyond just like we've looked at you know changing YAML and I and I mentioned that we can make Java changes but uh, I kind of want to I kind of want to show what that looks like so let's assume that uh, uh, we have uh, been using watches uh, in, in, and and a watch in a Kubernetes Fabricate client is is just a way to um, you know uh, subscribe to changes that happen to a resource and so in this case we're just looking at pods and we're going to do a watch and we're going to uh, uh, pass in this new watcher which we're creating anonymously. Um, the watcher API has a single method called event received which sends an action to, so in order to determine like what we need to do, uh, we need to actually look at that action. So it's either added, deleted, modified, et cetera. Um, so this, this this pattern might be spread out considerably over our code base. Um, and uh, there's nothing wrong with using watchers. It's just there's a, a, there's a new pattern. There's a new uh, capability that was uh, introduced called a shared informer, uh, an indexed informer that that we can make use of that includes other things that watchers don't do, uh, reconnecting, uh, caching. Uh, you know, uh, there's kind of this list watch functionality that you need to do. Of you know, when the, you first establish connection to the Kubernetes server, you're like, okay, now tell me what's there so I can go through and and uh, 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 and make sure that I have all of my resources set up and mapped correctly, and then I'm going to watch for changes that happen after that. And so, a shared informer actually looks Quite a bit different. I mean, instead of uh, instead of going into the pods and creating a watch, uh, uh, a shared informer, uh, uh, kind of you you pull out these 
shared informer and you create it for specific uh, resource type and then you add an event handler and then the event handler has actually separate methods on add on update uh, uh, on delete and so uh, what we what we can actually do with a recipe that would really be impossible to do any other way is we can target <clears throat> these complex changes these chains of, of of code execution and actually rewrite them based on the context in which they appear so uh, i can actually create a um, uh, i can create a recipe that looks for any instances of this watch method and that's the uh, that's the api call on the on the client that i'm calling and uh, anytime i find that i can actually get the type information uh, out of uh, the ast represented right here by you know this uh, uh, by our, our bracket um, I can find out what type this is that I'm passing in uh, and then I can use that later on when I'm creating uh, new code based on uh, a template so we have uh, uh, I can actually create you know Java code from scratch and I can templatize it and I can replace uh, this uh, value in here from the value that I've looked up in my AST so I can actually Go through i can pull out i can recognize that hey i'm in a case block uh, i know which one because it's a constant so i know exactly which one to pull out i can get the statements that are inside of that i can uh, i can create an, a new template i can create uh, i can go into these methods that i that i know exist because i'm creating this with a template i can say replace the contents of on add and so what i can end up with uh, is actually uh, instead of having this switch case, I can actually pull these statements out and rewrite them into their location uh, uh, as, as they need to be uh, somewhere else. So uh, I'm just going to run this locally, um, and I'm pretty sure that I have this installed through snapshots, so I guess we'll see if this is going to work. Uh, do a dry run real quick. So there you see, I'm, I'm out, I've activated my my Fabricate Watch to Shared Informer. Okay, it did find uh, uh, it did find uh, my application controller class that had an instance uh, of that pattern. And let's see what it decided to do. I know that's small. Let me make it bigger. Uh, okay, so here we can see. Uh, I am um, uh, I am replacing my use of the pods watch new watcher with Kubernetes client informer shared index informer and as I said I'm I know the type of watcher that I'm creating so I can replace that in fact I know the name of the variable that is the Kubernetes client and that is replaced as well because I mean I could name it anything uh, and that's a that's I, I decided not to to make this other change because I could point this out. Like the same situation applies here. And on add, I'm declaring this variable of this type, and I'm replacing that type because I I know what it is here. Uh, I could also replace this uh, variable name reference because I know what it is previously, and so I'm assuming that these other statements are going to reference that. So I could actually change that as well and, and templatize that and just add that to the recipe. Now this particular recipe that I'm demonstrating is like specifically targeted to my use of watches. This isn't a generic recipe that can be applied across any use of watches because there's, you know, uh, uh, many and sundry ways to uh, to implement uh, the watcher pattern. But I hope this gives you a little like just kind of glimpse of, um, you know, the kinds of like significant structural changes that can be made uh, to uh, change uh, YAML values to change uh, uh, to add and 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 migrate um, you know custom resources which are uh, this is uh, this operator operates on on custom resources and instead of creating an nginx deployment directly I create this uh, this application uh, document uh, this uh, resource uh, and I let the operator can change the name of it and, and, and get the my app name and change the port and create a service uh, that references that particular uh, port and 
I'm sort of running out of time, so I will. Uh, uh, I'm not going to demonstrate the uh, the whole uh, life cycle on that, but uh, I did want to. I, I just did want to point out that uh, yeah, that uh, um, this operator is two levels of uh, uh, abstraction where we're using the the we're using rewrite and YAML recipes to change kind of the uh, the basic uh, uh, structure of uh, of the YAML coming in in a secure way based on the model. And then in the case of an operator, we're actually making um, specific decisions based on how we deploy the, op the application. So, um, you know, maybe we, we never want to deploy a particular resource without other resources, right? Like we don't want to accidentally apply, you know, one YAML, but not apply another one. And so that's where that's where the operator kicks in and helps us, um, you know, like I'm just reading in this deployments YAML, uh, starting with that base and then making uh, making changes to it, uh, you know, kind of another layer of it so that I can, let's say, match, uh, make my match labels, right, which are this app and then the name of that I'm that I'm pulling in. So I can actually create a deployment and a service with the name out of the custom resource and then I can translate that across, I can create owner references. These are all things that you can do in, uh, you know, like in, a, in an operator that you wouldn't be able to necessarily do uh, um, just, uh, you know, deploying uh, uh, flat resources. So, uh, looks like we're getting get down to time here. I want to make sure that we've got uh, plenty of time for questions, discussion, any other things that uh, people are interested in seeing um yeah i guess just uh open it up for questions thanks john <clears throat> so everyone please put your questions in the q a if you have them um john right now we don't have anything i have a question though so for the recipes okay. uh, that you guys have on i think modern.io is the link you get you said you were gonna i think you said you were gonna open source them do you have a timeline for that so these recipes that are like if you look on our, our doc site, uh, these are all uh, um, recipes that are included as uh, if you go into the open rewrite uh, organization, there's a number of like rewrite spring, testing frameworks, uh, re rewrite Kubernetes is in here. These are all open source. So there's nothing about the recipes themselves. I mean, they're just, uh, you know, they're just a bit of Java code that does particular things and those are you know published out there and those are those are all available. Uh, the the thing that's unique with the SAS is that uh, it's it's the way that uh, the way that these recipes are applied to your code base and you know we we know about all of the the repositories that you have access to because you know uh, those are things that you it's just really impossible to do that in like a like a Maven plugin. I mean it's only you know it only relates to one specific uh, uh, um, uh, project just by necessity, so it's you know that's just a limitation that uh, that, that that you're going to get going with that one. But as far as the recipes themselves and all of the uh, yeah all of the different things that you can apply to them, they're all listed on the doc site. They're all uh, on on the GitHub, uh, and you can you can go in and you know uh, uh, these are updated whenever we put new recipes out. This documentation gets updated, and, and et cetera. So okay, awesome. And a question that just came in is, what languages are support are supported by Open Rewrite? So right now, uh, primarily Java, um, and what you see here. So J Java, YAML, uh, and then the variations on those. Um, we are working on TypeScript, and uh, we have um, uh, HCL for Terraform. Um, there, there's a number of um, like proper programming languages, full full blown programming languages that are that are on the roadmap, but it requires creating a, you know, we we essentially have to create, you know, this mapping of this AST of like every possible construct in the language to uh, an element in the AST. So uh, that's just uh, uh it's just some work that needs to be done. Okay. And let me see. I think that's all the questions we have for today, John. Thank you so much. This was very insightful and very helpful. 
uh, for the rest of everyone else, like I put the link in the survey to the survey in the chat. Please fill it out. It helps John. It helps us understand what where we need to improve and what we're doing well. Um, but aside from that, I'll send out the slides in the recording in one or two days, and I believe that will have John's contact information in case you have any questions. So thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.